Okay, we're going to do chapter 10, which covers blood. Now, this is a little bit longer chapter, so we're going to cut it into two recordings. So I'll do the first half of the chapter in this recording, but make sure you go back and listen to the second half of the chapter in a different recording. As with previous chapters, you'll have your list of objectives that you'll want to listen to the lecture, read the chapter, and then go back and answer these questions to make sure that you've fully understood the chapter. Okay, blood is a fluid type of connective tissue. It has the formed elements, which are the living cells, and they're typically heavier, and plasma, the non-living fluid matrix, which does have fibrin strands in it, but we only see those in clotting. Now, if you take the blood and you centrifuge it, you spin it down, the formed elements, which again are the heavier ones, settle to the bottom while the plasma remains at top. Here you can see the centrifuged blood, and again, the formed elements sink to the bottom, plasma goes to the top. So let's look at that centrifuged blood a little closer. Now the plasma portion is 55% of your blood is plasma. Again, it's lighter, so it's what shows up at the top as that yellow. Then all that red to the bottom is the formed elements along with that buffy coat. Now the red is just erythrocytes, which make up 45% of blood. That buffy coat makes up 1%. The buffy coat includes the leukocytes, which are the white blood cells, and the platelets, which are used for clotting. Now, erythrocytes are what we call red blood cells, and they give blood its red color. Their major function is to transport oxygen. Now, hematocrit. A hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells in the bloodstream. Males typically have 47 percent plus or minus 5 percent. In science, everything is plus or minus 5 percent. Females have less with 42 percent plus or minus 5 percent. And that's typically due to females having less muscle mass, which has less blood requirements. Now, you can tell a lot about looking at blood. For example, if we look at this centrifuge blood to the right and we look at that buffy coat, the thicker buffy coat tells us that there are more leukocytes, which are your white blood cells. Okay, You increase your white blood cells when you have an infection of some kind. So if you have a thick buffy coat, that tells us that your body's fighting off some type of infection. Now you can also tell a lot about the color of blood, which we're going to hit on to here in just a few minutes. Okay, some of the characteristics. Blood, of course, is sticky, opaque, and has a metallic taste, and that's due to the iron found in blood. Now it's scarlet to dull red in color. The brighter the red of blood, the more oxygen it has. The duller the color, the less oxygen it has. So again, you can tell a lot just by looking at it. Now, blood is more viscous or thick than water. It also has a pH of 7.35 to 7.45. Now, we'll deal more with pH toward the end of this course when it deals with blood. Now, blood is also slightly warmer than body temperature at about 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, based on a 98.6 degree body temperature. Now, blood accounts for 8% of your body weight in men, five to six liters, and in women, four to five liters. All right, let's talk about plasma. Plasma is 90% water. It contains over a hundred different substances, like respiratory gases, both oxygen and carbon dioxide. It's got hormones, plasma proteins, waste, all kind of stuff. Now, the plasma proteins are by far the most abundant, and those are made by the liver. Albumin is the <coughs> largest of the plasma proteins, and it helps contribute to the osmotic pressure, thus keeping water in the bloodstream, which is a big deal since it's 90% water. Now, you talk more about you know keeping water in the bloodstream when we discuss blood vessels. Now, there are also clotting proteins found in plasma, and those help stop blood loss. All right, so the formed elements, you have three. You have red blood cells, which are called erythrocytes, 
white blood cells, which are called leukocytes, and platelets, which are also called thrombocytes. Now, if you look to the picture to the left, you see most of the picture is made up with these pale pink cells. Those are erythrocytes, so they are by far the most abundant blood cell. The large purple ones are leukocytes, or white blood cells. Notice there's not as many of those. And then the little tiny polka dots to the upper left are the platelets, and there's even less of those. Now, of the three formed elements, white blood cells are the only complete cell. Platelets are actually fragments of cells, and erythrocytes have spit out their nucleus and organelles, so they're no longer a complete cell. All of them survive only a few days. Most don't divide. They're renewed or made in the bone marrow. All right, so let's talk specifically about erythrocytes. Again, these are red blood cells. They have a biconcave shape and a depressed center. Okay, that's not for no reason, so why do they have the depressed center and the biconcave shape? Well, first of all, it, that awkward shape helps them to bend and squeeze around tight spaces, like around your elbow when it's bent or your knee when it's bent. Now, the depressed center helps increase your surface area. The more surface area to a red blood cell, the more hemoglobin it can carry. And hemoglobin carries oxygen, so the more hemoglobin it can carry, the more oxygen it can carry, making the red blood cell as efficient as possible. Now, the major function is to transport oxygen and to contribute to the viscosity of the bloodstream, the thickness of it. So if you increase the number of red blood cells, then the blood becomes thicker and harder to push. Why, if you decrease it, it becomes thinner and a little easier to push. Now, again, it is anucleated and contains very few organelles. It spits out most of them. We'll talk about that process toward the end of this chapter. Again, it contains hemoglobin, which is the iron-bearing protein that binds oxygen and a little carbon dioxide, which is your CO2. The amount determines how well they function. Now, hemoglobin primarily carries oxygen. If there's no oxygen available, then it'll carry some CO2, but not a lot. So it's not competing. Now, one of the biggest things that red blood cells have done is they lack mitochondria. They have spit out their mitochondria. Why is that important? Well, remember back, mitochondria uses oxygen to make ATP. Well, the major function of the red blood cell is to carry oxygen. So you wouldn't want to still have mitochondria or they would be using the oxygen you're carrying. So we spit that out quickly. Homeostatic imbalance. You have anemia. This is a decrease in oxygen carrying ability. It could be due to not enough red blood cells or maybe you have enough red blood cells but you have abnormal or deficient hemoglobin content. One example would be sickle cell anemia. This is a genetic disorder where the hemoglobin protein is changed by one amino acid. So you make an abnormal hemoglobin that becomes spiky. When low on oxygen, the red blood cells become spiky shaped and then they get stuck in the small blood vessels. This can be excruciatingly painful for these people. Now, carriers of the gene are resistant to malaria, so I guess that's kind of like your bonus. However, we can treat sickle cell anemia and we do it for we, we've gotten much better at sickle cell anemia treatment. Now, one of the things that obviously you're not going to want to do is live in an area with low oxygen. So you wouldn't want to live in the mountains or higher elevations. You'd like to stay somewhere close to sea level where there is more readily available oxygen. All right, in this picture, you can see the top is a normal erythrocyte where the bottom is the sickle cell with the abnormal hemoglobin. Another imbalance is polycythemia vera, which is an excess of red blood cells. Okay, so again, the problem here is you've got so many red blood cells, it increases the viscosity or the thickness of blood, making it very sluggish and almost like sludge. So it's very hard for um, your body to push it, so your blood pressure will increase. Now, this is most often a result of bone marrow cancer you would diagnose this with a red blood cell count of 8 to 11 million. 
Now a normal red blood cell count is 4 to 5 million. So you can see the blood volume almost doubles. That's also going to affect circulation. Why? Well, because again, your blood pressure is only going to elevate so long and so high. So you're trying to push all this blood from your heart all the way down your tippy toes and your fingers and eventually it just gets exhausted so you won't get blood to your fingers and toes so you have problems with circulation that way now secondary polycythemia is a normal response to high altitude this results from less available oxygen or a decrease in EPO production alright so less available oxygen this would be like you live in Florida, we're at sea level, plenty of oxygen, and you vacation to the Colorado mountains. Okay, much higher elevation, less oxygen available. Your body is going to start producing more red blood cells to handle that. And you would diagnose this with a red blood cell count of 6 to 8 million. Again, this is a temporary thing. There isn't really anything wrong with the body, it's just that there's less oxygen available. So you may need to put them on a normal saline drip, so just dilute the blood. Now, what is that decreased EPO production? EPO stands for erythropoietin. That is the hormone that stimulates red blood cell production. So you could not be producing enough erythropoietin. But that's not normal. You need to go back and further investigate. The kidneys is what makes erythropoietin. So you would definitely want to go investigate the kidneys, make sure you're not in kidney failure, and that's the reason why the erythropoietin levels are low. Blood doping. This is where athletes draw their blood a few days before and then replace the day of the event. Higher red blood cells deliver more oxygen. More oxygen means more ATP, so they can run faster, go for longer, jump higher. Now this is banned in the Olympics for that reason. However, boxers, baseball players, it's completely legal and they do it all the time. All right, in the bottom left, you can see what a normal red blood cell count looks like versus polycythemia with all those extra red blood cells in the upper right-hand corner. All right, now let's move on to leukocytes, which are white blood cells. These makes up less than 1% of the total blood volume. These are important for your immune defense. So white blood cells are going to be hunting down and killing the bad stuff. Now, they are the only complete cells in the blood with a nucleus and everything. Now, diapedesis. This is the process of moving into and out of blood vessels. White blood cells are the only ones that can leave the bloodstream like this. Now, well, I take that back. Platelets can leave it as well, but red blood cells cannot. Positive chemotaxis is where chemicals and damaged tissue recruit white blood cells to defend against microorganisms or to clean debris, and it also causes calls for an increase in white blood cell production. All right, so let's give a little scenario here. You've cut your hand. Okay. First thing that happens is you broke through that skin barrier. So any bacteria or virus on your hand now has easy access into the body. So the first thing that's going to happen is that damaged tissue is going to start releasing chemicals, calling out to all the white blood cells. And of course increase the production of white blood cells. Those white blood cells will travel to your hand via the bloodstream. Your arteries will bring them too but they still have to go through diapedesis. They have to leave the artery and enter the tissue. Now those chemicals that the damaged tissue is releasing will call the white blood cells to that specific area. So they're not out just wandering in the tissue trying to find out where they need to go. Now leukocytosis is an increased amount of white blood cells where leukopenia is a decreased level of white blood cells. Now these are both considered normal because they are normal responses in your body. If you have an infection, you're fighting off a virus, then you're going to go through leukocytosis. You're going to increase the amount of white blood cells. That's normal. It's what your body should do. Now an imbalance or not normal would be leukemia. This is cancerous bone marrow which causes an increase in white blood cells. But it, that's not the problem. It's the fact that they're releasing those white blood cells when they are immature and unable to defend the body. So they're essentially useless. Now, 
there are two categories for leukocytes or white blood cells. There's granulocytes and agranulocytes. There are five types of white blood cells and all five will fit into one of these two categories. So let's start with granulocytes. These are white blood cells that contain granules, thus their name. Neutrophils are one of them. Neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cell and these are phagocytes of acute infection, so quick, immediate, big infections. Isonophils are another type. They're associated with allergies and inflammation and parasite infections. Basophils contain histamine and recruit white blood cells. So a good way to remember this is all of your fills, neutrophils, isonophil, basophils, are filled with granules so that you know they fit into granulocytes. The other category is agranulocytes, and these are white blood cells with no granules. The two types here are lymphocytes and monocytes. Lymphocytes is the second most abundant white blood cell, and although they are found in the bloodstream, they're rarely found there. They're typically found in the lymphatic tissue, like your lymph nodes and lymph organs. And of course, they are um, a responder in the immune system. Monocytes are the largest of the white blood cells, and these will change into macrophages to help fight infections once they leave the bloodstream. The last of the formed elements are platelets, and these are fragments of cells called megakaryocytes. They're needed to clot blood vessels that have ruptured. Hematopoiesis. This is blood cell formation that occurs in myeloid tissue or red bone marrow. In adults, we find this in the skull, pelvis, ribs, sternum, and proximal epiphyses of the humerus and femur. Remember, the epiphyses are the ends. Now, all formed elements, that means red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, all come from hemocytoblast, which is a type of stem cell. If you look at the suffix blast, blast means build. So any type of blast cell is going to be a stem cell. So in our instance, it's a hemocytoblast. Now those will form either lymphoid stem cells or myeloid stem cells. In this illustration, we can see that hemocytoblast is either going to go to the left and make a lymphoid stem cell. That stem cell will only make lymphocytes. Or the hemocytoblast can make a myeloid stem cell, which then can make any of the others. Any erythrocytes, your red blood cells, it makes platelets, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. All right, so we're still talking about hematopoiesis, but now more specifically, we're going to talk about erythropoiesis, which is the production of red blood cells. Now, as your red blood cells develop, they divide many times, they synthesize or make hemoglobin, they eject the nucleus and the organelles, and then collapse. The reticulocyte is a young red blood cell with ER, endoplasmic reticulum, and that is what enters the bloodstream. Then it matures in about two days by finally ejecting the last of the ER. In this illustration, you can see on the left-hand side, there is the hemocytoblast. That is that stem cell, and you can see it progress and mature until finally you see the reticulocyte count, and then the, or excuse me, the reticulocyte and the erythrocyte. Now, when we do blood work, one of the things we can do is a reticulocyte count. This tells us how fast we are making red blood cells. Erythropoietin, remember that's the hormone that controls the rate of erythrocyte production, and it's produced by the kidneys, and it targets the bone marrow, since that's where you make red blood cells. Now, negative feedback mechanism. All right, for example, you have low oxygen levels. That's going to cause the kidneys to increase erythropoietin production, which will cause more red blood cells to be produced, which can carry more oxygen, thus reversing the imbalance. Same thing happens on the flip side. If you have high levels of oxygen, that will cause the kidneys to decrease their production of erythropoietin, 
you'll make less red blood cells, you'll have less oxygen, and you'll breathe back into homeostasis. Leukopoiesis. This is white blood cell production, and this is also stimulated by hormones, your interleukins, and your colony stimulating factors. Now, you have the lymphoid stem cell, which we talked about a minute ago. Those will give rise to only lymphocytes. The myeloid stem cell will make all the other white blood cells, and the lifespan varies for each cell type. So in this illustration, again, you see at the top the hemocytoblast. To the left is a myeloid stem cell, which will eventually make your eosinophils, basophils, neutrophils, monocytes. Now remember, they also make platelets and red blood cells. Go back up to the top to the hemocytoblast. To the right, you see the lymphoid stem cell. Remember, this will only make lymphocytes. Okay, I'm going to stop here. And in this recording, remember to listen to the second half of this recording.